All right, we're live. Say hello. Hi, Alex. How are you? Welcome Hi. to uh, 2915 Biscayne Boulevard. Kobe, thanks for having me, man. Thanks I for coming it. over. Well, I warned Kobe that we come out with a lot of energy, so here we go. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Alex Vidal. I am president of Related ISG International Realty and host of the show you're watching today, episode number 56 of The Closer Club. And even though this is episode number 56, it's a first for the series where we have our first architect on the show, Mr. Kobe Karp. One of uh, not only Miami, but the country's most renowned architects. So we have a set of questions that a lot of you haven't heard before. So here we go. Kobe, you ready? Ready, Alex. Go ahead. Let's, All right, well, let's do it. Kobe, from Israel to Minneapolis to hopefully your favorite spot, Miami, where you are head of one of the most renowned architectural firms in the country. Tell us a little bit about your path to where you are today. So I was born in 1962. And you look great. I took a shower once a week, whether I needed or not. Hey, <laughs> Got some curlings, you already uh, give me a hard time. So, but basically the bottom line is I was born in 1962 in uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota, in uh, Israel. And when I was 11 years old, my family moved to Minneapolis, Minnesota. I grew up the key years in Minneapolis in the Midwest. So I went from the Mideast to the Midwest, as I like to say. Okay. And I grew up there, um, junior high, high school, um, and university. I graduated from University of Minnesota with two degrees. One of them, which- Well, they're the gophers, right? Golden Gophers. Go, oh, Golden Gophers, got it. Hey, let's stay. I know you keep looking at it because this is our company. This is our company. I'm going to take it off. I'm going to steal that. No, I, I'll get this. But this is, this is not a Florida Gator, by the way. I know it's a it's it's ISG related. It's an ISG Gator. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to know. I got it. We got stories about that. But no, the bottom line is that my first degree was environmental design from the Institute of Technology. And, and that became a more important diploma as life went on. Okay. Because what happened is that whether I designed hotels in the Caribbean, I came here in the late 80s. It was Miami Vice and Scarface case. Okay. So it was a bit different. Our offices were on Lincoln Road at 925 Lincoln Road, okay. where books and books are in the Sterling building. And what we were doing is designing hotels in the Caribbean. Jamaica, St. Lucia, Bahamas, Grenada. It was great. But what happened is that understanding the tropics, understanding the environmental design and how it relates to building and designing luxury hotels and resorts, became very important. Many people believe that green environmental is a way to do it or we have to meet codes and requirements. For me, environmentally correct, sustainability correct, um, designing it as such is a money-saving venture. If I sell you your house or your hotel in a way that is more sustainable and more resilient, on the long term, as a property owner, as a hotel manager, as a condo hotel owner, you're saving money. So today, the houses we're designing have in them um, solar panels that can collect the sun energy and store it in something that is a good battery. But let's we'll come back to the ah, okay. let's go back to the, the, the so you were in Minnesota. What brought you down? What brought you down here? How did you end up down here? Well, they told me that they needed draw traffic. Uh, oh, okay, that was, that was a good time. That was a good time to be in Miami, then for sure. So what happened is I joined a British firm that was building all inclusive resorts and hotels in what they call the British West Indies, okay. and they needed an American architect, and they hired me. And we were producing our drawings here in Miami, and then Federal expressing them in thermal fax pay for back then to the Caribbean, to St. Lucia and to the Caribbean. Yeah. Now, looking back on your career, storied career, what would you say was a breakthrough moment for you? We haven't gone through the questions, so what would you say was a breakthrough moment that, because you're not just an architect. You are, you are, for what many consider, a star architect, right? That's the, the new term. What was that breakthrough moment for you that kind of really took your career off, and what can our viewers learn from that? I think the breakthrough period of time came as things were changing in Miami mm -hmm. in a drastic fashion. What I mean by that is that, for example, in 1992, we had a hurricane. And people needed simple things like doing roof inspections. So I volunteered to do the roof inspections and to drive my Wrangler Jeep throughout and do that. And so that gave me an understanding of how buildings and structures have been built and how they are not going to be built in the future in South Florida, okay. which became very important throughout the United States of America. And why people hire me internationally because of our tropical, sustainable understanding of what it is here in Florida. So let me get this right. Here you are, come down from Minneapolis, 
one of the biggest, even then, one of the biggest architects in Miami. The hurricane hits, which we talked about currently, that, that happened yes. in the summer of my freshman year, going yes. into my freshman year. You got in your Jeep, which I knew I went to, because yes. I'm a, a hair Jeep. I've had two brand I love Wranglers, there's no way to go. I have a Ford Raptor now. There's yes. only two cars I've ever owned, a Raptor and a Wrangler. Yeah. You were driving around doing roof inspections? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had a girlfriend, and she would write down all the paperwork, and we had a 35 millimeter Yashica camera, because mm -hmm. there was no way to track and make sure that you're doing the right thing. Sure. So she would write everything down, and then, I don't know, it was 150 or 250 per inspection, and we would drive from sunrise to sunset to do the inspections. Um, and you have to remember, this is, you know, Homestead in South Miami. Yeah. It looked like a war zone. War zone. Now, were you doing that? Were you doing that because just the architecture business had stopped, so that was a way to make means? Yes, or? yes, exactly right. There was nobody picking up the phone and calling me up and say, "Oh, come on, let's do some work." Um, that was the only work that was available. And uh, my girlfriend was pretty good at you know collecting all the money, so I kept her around, and that was it. Twenty five years later, I'm still married. <laughs> Is she gonna watch this later? That's in case you're watching, this is about you. <laughs> what, well, what I love about that is here you are, where, where you weren't afraid to do what, what a lot of people would look at as grunt work to survive until you're so. You must do. Up. You must do the grunt work. You must never look at it as grunt work because if you understand, I came from construction background in Minneapolis, Minnesota. There was no work in an office, so I was working shoveling snow on buildings. I was framing. I was digging ditches. I was putting railroad ties for landscaping. If you are able to do that, then you become a more complete designer and architect. You become what other people have always said is the master architect. You understand construction. You understand how to build. You understand foundation. You understand the outdoors to the indoors relationship. It's very, very critical and important. And I was lucky enough to have that experience. Interesting. I, I've been in real estate 22 years now, I'm 41, got in it when I was 19. I started off as the secretary to the owner of Kai's Real Estate. We're yes. still very close today, but you know, you said that, I'm like, I, I know what he's talking about. Because you're right, I went through that grunt work of being a secretary on up. Now, you've designed some of the most beautiful homes and buildings in all of South Florida. What are your high net worth clients telling you about why they chose Miami? So, the high net worth, it's a macro picture. Sure. Miami and South Florida has an increase, according to the United States Census, of 1% on an annual basis. So after 10 years, it compounds to be 10%, more than 10% because sure. it compounds, right? So what happens is that when I came here in the late 80s, there were still people moving here to South Florida. And those people were, generally speaking, retirees from the Northeast on a, on a fixed income. Or people who came by boat from Havana. Sure. Not by boat, they were paddling. Yeah, yeah I don't know, right? They, they wish it was a boat. Right, they wish it was a boat. So what happens is that the 1% continues to grow on an annual basis, but the per capita and the, and the education level of the individual has increased. So the elderly who were on a fixed income are still coming, but now they're being supported by individuals who are coming here to go to universities, to build a business, to become a service in the community, and that's what we are seeing in Florida. So I see a large, continuous growth, natural growth of the population that's coming to what is the only subtropical weather state in the lower 48. And that's important to understand, because if you grew up in Kansas or, or Minnesota or Wisconsin or most of the other states, you're looking for a good location to have a good quality of life. And South East Florida can provide you with that. Whether it's Fort Lauderdale, Palm Beach, West End, Doral, Miami. I mean, we are just now, we've been, I've been building in Sunny Isles Beach, Aventura, Miami Beach, Hollywood, but now we're starting to build downtown Miami, which has been left alone, if you will, until George Perez and company started to get involved in it in the last boom. It's been dormant for the past decades. So, Wynwood, and those areas are going to be what I think is the next urban fabric and districts in Miami. So it really sounds like these really these guys that are hiring you and, and families and women that are hiring you to design these really nice homes are saying, hey, the weather here can't be beat. The weather cannot be beat. Today's technology and the way business is done, we can work pretty much anywhere. 
we, the quality of life, whether it's social, cultural, um, whether it's the, the environmental, the medicine, the research and development of genetics, all of that is coming together in a very strong fashion here in Florida and it's becoming a destination where it never was. It was about the sea, the sun, and the sand, and now it's completely changing around to become a bit more than that. And I see that in the next generation, meaning I see my kids who are going to school and, there's, and their friends are saying, we're coming back to Florida. Yeah. We don't know if we're coming back during school, after school, a couple of years after, but their future is Southeast Florida, which is very promising. Well, it's interesting because you're seeing this, this big demand now coming from the domestic buyer in yes. South Florida. And now as a designer, and this was actually a question I told Craig, who spoke very highly of you, Craig's like, you know, ask Kobe this question. What are the taste preferences among the high-end buyers that are the typical high-end buyers from South America, and now we're seeing the high-end buyers from North America? Is there a taste difference? Do you have to design differently for, for each type of customer? Yes. So, I came to Florida, as I told you, in the late 80s, and I worked doing luxury resorts and hotels in the Caribbean. Um, and those understandings came really from, if you will, the back of house, right? I used to work in hotels and hospitality and construction, and that gave me an understanding how to manage and how to operate a restaurant so that the guest experience and the daily life experience is reached to its maximum. Sure. We do it in hospitality, it's where we don't cross the guest experience with the service experience unless it's needed. Okay. On a daily basis, we have a short life, whether you will live 50 years or 90 years or 100 years, it's still a short period of time. So what most people want, whether it's affordable housing or luxury housing or market rate or subsidized, they want a good quality of life. Okay. In order to provide you that, it's very simple things. It's, we provide right now a space that is simple, that is zen-like, that lets you be part of the environment. Whether it's the sunrise, if you're looking to the east, or the sunset, if you're looking to the west. And if you're lucky to have both sides, it's a sunrise to the sunset. And how is that in relationship to the tropics, to the garden? Not everybody can have a view of the water. Sure. Some people can have a view of the ocean, which is dark at night. Some people can have a view of the bay, which is beautiful sunsets. But if you are able, if I'm able to give you a tree within your environment, or a landscaping, and make you part of the environment, that gives you inner comfort. That gives you inner tranquility. It gives you a good quality of so, life. It's so funny as you say that. Look at the. That's not going to come out of camera, but that's exactly what's going on on the screen behind you. Yeah, it, and, and that's what's going on, on the screen. And that's also what's going on outside. We have a concrete bunker, but we have a green tree canopy outside, and that gives you a certain sense of tranquility and a sense of of humanity, yeah. which is very important as architects and designers to provide you with. Does that change? Is it the same if it's a buyer, if it's a high net worth buyer coming from New York, or it's a high net worth buyer coming from Rio or Sao Paulo? Mm -hmm. Are they looking for the same thing? Everybody's looking for the same thing. Everybody's looking for the same thing. We're all the same. We're all individuals, like, and it's like architecture, buildings are the same. They're all built in the same mean and method. But you and I have the same parts of us, the ribs and heart and lungs, and hopefully they're all there, and they put us all together. But I have two boys. And they, they, you have four boys, and, and hopefully they came from the same father and mother, yes. like mine. Hopefully did. Well, oh, three, three of four. Yes, <laughs> but they're substantially the same on the inside, but they're very different on the outside. Oh yeah. And same thing with architecture. Architecture is different from building to building. And what happens here is that the parts that make the the the, the, the pieces come together in the design are all the same. And you need to provide as a designer as an architect something that create that gives the sense of comfort and zen and social civility to the space and it's very very important to provide you you went to a school a good school curly curly when you look at the spatial relationships and how it sits on the side and how it relates to the green space it's very good it's very important and that's what creates a better environment even if we come to a building like this how it is that we open it up and make it a better space that is what we specialize in doing. We take buildings and we recycle them. We take buildings where there is a surf club. We bring you into the historic before we bring you into the new. And not everybody thinks that way. 
I had big discussions with the other architect, Richard Meyer, working on the job. He said, no, Kobe, let him come in the new part because it's ego. You want to come into the new. But no, most people want to come into the historic. They want to get a sense, and then they go into the new. That kind of process is what people live on. It's what makes people understand. When, pe when people meet people, they want to know, where did you come from? Who's your father? Who's your mother? What is the You're asking, you were asking me all that when we first met. And there's a whole show on TV now that is all about DNA, ancestry, and telling people who they are and what they're from so they can understand who they are and they can see where they're going. The, the, the rich and the poor and anywhere in the middle want the same thing. They want a decent quality of life. More gold, that makes no difference. More stainless steel makes no difference. It's how you orient the spaces and how you compose the spaces in a three-dimensional way, indoor and outdoor, it creates the value. Whether it's a penthouse with a rooftop terrace, whether it is a garden that is within a house with a tree growing out of it with natural light. Those are the kind of things that make or break a space. And that's what we try to do. I love it. I think that that's as realtors who are mainly the ones that are watching this. Yes. It really should shape how they speak to customers about the properties that they're looking at. It's not just look at this beautiful open kitchen, it's how is this kitchen going to play a role in, in their life if they were to buy the unit? Or, or and, 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 area and, and like you said, Craig, you know, I've known Craig for a quarter of a century, but what I'm able to do on an ongoing basis is to provide a vehicle for him or for her to sell the product Absolutely. In, in a value-driven fashion. You can't bamboozle people. People see right away that they're creating value. JP, John Paul, right? We created a whole environment that is in touch with the Windwood, but it has a secret garden on the inside with stepping rooftop terraces. That's when people go, wow, I can live here. I want to live here. It's unique. It's special. And they can see the value if the price is the same as everybody else. Sure. And that's what people continue to buy. Palau, we do the same thing in Palau. They did the perform on a number that was 60 to 70 percent of what they sold their units in because there were things done architecturally that created a value that people said, I want to live here. And that's very, very important to do on an ongoing basis and seeing the value in each and every building. It's like seeing the value in each and every individual. People meet people all the time, but to find the essence of each individual and use that as, and push it forward as the strength, you're making the person, you're making the building better, but most importantly, you're making yourself better as an architect. If I can find that on an ongoing basis in my buildings, in my spaces, and in, in, in whether it's a large development or it's a little interior design project, it makes no difference. I'm creating a value that people then say, wow, I, I want to buy it. And you can't argue with success. I think one of the favorite designs of mine, of yours, is Chateau. I have a customer looking at Chateau, and I just, the way it sits on the lot, knowing something's going to be built on the north side, so that's all concrete. Knowing that the park is on the south side, that's always going to be a park. Phenomenal job there. And again, there, just the idea was, people always looked at it, I want to face the ocean, right? We said, no, we want to face the ocean and we want to face the sunset. And oops, by the way, you get to see the panorama of the park. Sorry. What happens then is that you have a lot more glass to sell and you have a lot more view to sell, but also the quality of life within the unit is so much better. And you walk in and you see the ocean directly from the lobby, which very few buildings there is. Yeah, right. Very. Now I've asked this question to a lot of people, so I'd love to hear your answer on this one. If you were to give, if Miami was a person, and you were to give it an age, what age would you give it, and why? Let's see how you compare to the other ten people I've asked. At least. Well, Miami originally, when it was started to be found by the Indians who lived here on the river for the fresh water, right? So, and, and then you can say Miami was created and established a hundred years ago. I just had the pleasure of working. But forget all that. Like, I know Miami's been around a hundred, New York's been around for, but if it was a human being, in terms of what it's accomplished and where it's going in its future, if you were to put it in human Six life, years. Six years old. Really, why? Because the expansion and development of the city has not yet even reached its puberty. Only now do I start to see genetics and medicine. Only now do I start to see the logistics really come here that is not just connected to the seaport and to the airport, but I see it through each and every county, sure. right? I see the connectivity of Orlando to Palm Beach, 
to Fort Lauderdale, to Miami, through the train only now starting. We are now starting what we originally established 100 years ago, and we stopped. Trains, connectivity. Why is it that I need to drive to St. Pete to go see a project? I should be able to sit comfortably on the Wi-Fi in the train, get there, boom, take an Uber to the site, and come back the same day. I should not be flying there. I should not be driving there. And I do drive. I drive to Orlando to have lunch, and I come back there. Yeah. But that's not the way it should be. Only now we're starting that. Why are we only six years of age? We're only six years of age because the state itself hasn't completed certain things. I'll give you an example. I grew up, I grew up in Minneapolis, Minnesota. In Minneapolis, there is IBM, 3M, Archer Daniels Midland. There are steel companies. There is wood companies. There is Pillsbury, the Doughboy. There is Honeywell. There is all these companies that have been there and were created by the individuals in the community. We don't have that here. We are just now starting to create certain companies, Pan American Eastern Airlines. What I'm working on now are things that for the future is going to be relevant for the community. That's what I'm working on now. And what I'm working on is mixed use projects that will sustain the community. Some people are talking about it, but the projects that I'm involved in now, they're very big, they're multifunction, and they're really about creating values and creating educational vehicles. We're doing a project now that it has education and schooling within it, but it's only for the trade, for the people who make clothes, for the people who fix air conditioning units and make the cameras and fix it. That general education is very specific. Yes, yes. For what we used to call, you know, a arts and crafts or blue collar instead of, of, instead of going to college, right? I mean, I went to college, I studied architecture, but think of all the other people who build buildings and electricians and plumbers and mechanics and where do they go to school and so and that's what this project this development is all about within a mixed use by a train which has affordable and sustainable and workforce housing how big is that building by the way that is a 22 acre site which, yes when it will be done we'll have residential apartments which is about 3500 but it will have the schooling and the community services within it and, and, and 3,500 apartments, uh, some people, to them, it sounds like a lot. I tell them, no, look, I work for Jose Milton, may he rest in peace. And he came to me and he said, in the late 90s, to do a project on North Bay Road, and which was unincorporated Dade County before it became Sunny Isles Beach. And he said, I want to do this, three buildings. And he built them. It's called Intercoastal Yacht Club. Yeah. And uh, Jose built everything in cash. And I said to him, Jose, you know, aren't you scared about He says, no, it's 300. And he explained to me his logic and how he does it. And at the end, he was right. And I did Intercoastal Yacht Club, and I did Blue Lagoon for him. I did multiple projects, which each one is a thousand apartments in locations which are completely negative compared to where it is that we're looking at sure. these sites right now. Now, talk about, this is a great segue into the next question. This was another question that came from Craig, which was, you know, 20, 30 years ago, even up until recently, a lot of the buildings that were being built, 20 stories, 30 stories, 50 stories, maybe 60, but there's a lot of buildings that are being proposed right now that are 90 stories, 100 plus stories. What do you think the feasibility of these, they're being developed in New York, but what are the feasibility of these buildings actually being developed here in South Florida? These are monsters. I, th I think that they're very um, feasible. There is a new Miami 21 code, which makes them a bit slenderer. I had a project approved for Africa Israel, which was then approved for um, Tibor Hollow, uh, which had what was called a MOSF, a major use special permit under the old code, so the footprint can be made bigger. And you can see it, the building is built, it's 850 feet. It's called, uh, it's at 1101 Brickell, it's called Panorama. Yeah. That building, you know, Tibor called me up and I was working in Abu Dhabi. And um, he says to me, you know, Kobe, where are you? We're gonna have a meeting with the structural engineer. And I said to him, Tibor, I'm in Abu Dhabi. He goes, fine. So when you come back to my we'll have a meeting. I can't wait. Uh, Vincent de Simone, may he rest in peace, a structural engineer, Stephen Feller. And Tibor said, I'm going to take the money that you owe and I'm going to break it up into equal payments for the next 27 months. So the structural engineer says, okay. The MVP engineer says, okay. And Kobe says, wow. You know, and then, then Tibor says, you know, Kobe, the reason is very simple. Where it was 2009, people were walking out with boxes out of Lehman Brothers. Yeah. He says, I've been through the trials and tribulations of the real estate economy. It's 
especially here in Florida. And he is a visionary in Otibo. And he said, I think it's gonna take us about 24 months to come out of this issue. And I gotta give myself some extra time. So it's gonna be 27 months. Do you accept the payment schedule? Of course you accept it. There was nothing else going on. There was no other. Of course we'll accept it. Beats roof inspections. Absolutely. <laughs> And, he, and you have to be humble in your thought process, but he was more realistic. And he, obviously you saw, he built the building, he finished the building, and it's a multi-generational asset, you know, the Banco de Venezuela used to be in there, you know. And it has changed, FIU is in there now, it goes back to what is it you and I are talking, I'm on the board of FIU. And this is the kind of things that build the community. There's a need for that. And that's what we are going into. The University of Miami now is looking at architecture and planning and legal and construction all coming together as a development service. Those are the things that build the community into society. 1101 Panorama is, is an example. I do How think tall is Panorama? 850. And I think those are very, and 750 is the Four Seasons. And I think that that's what's gonna happen. The land value, and now everybody's wants and desires to live in the urban fabric of Miami. They walk the streets. And I think it's a phenomenal thing. So and those buildings are coming up. Uh, for sure. I, I, you, can bank on you can bank on it. There you go. Now, you're a very well-known architect in Miami, but also around the world, as we've already discussed. How do you compare yourself with the other architects that have arrived on the scene in the last 10 years? Look, I, my grandmother used to say, you should only look at yourself. You should look at yourself and how it is that you interact with people. I don't look at other architects as competition. I look at people like Frank Lloyd Wright, I look at other, you know, Corbusier as inspirational architects and designers for what it is that they saw. A hundred years ago, Frank Lloyd Wright was like grew up in the prairie style Minnesota. The natural environment and natural materials and concrete and contemporary, yet warm and woodsy, is what it is that we like. Um, and so I, I'm a modernist, but I don't like the white boxes. I like materials and finishes or that make you feel unique and special to the tropics or whether you're in Colorado or whether we're building in Abu Dhabi or in Turkmenistan. I think you need to have that sense and grounding of the locale, of who you are and telling the story. So people who go to, into the building in Cape Town, South Africa, feel it's special, feel that it's unique to them. And I think that's important. And what happens is that as an architect in Florida, um, at the age I'm in, I'm lucky that other people around the world desire and want that. And they use us for that vehicle. They use us for the design and the conceptualization and the vision of those ideas and those thoughts to implement in their communities. So how many, this is not on here, one of my questions is gonna be, which project are you most proud of and why? Which one's your favorite? But how many, if you were to tally it up, how many projects are you involved in throughout uh, your career? I, I don't count. You don't count. So you lost count. All right, so what's I your favorite? Know. I have two favorites. Okay. Um, I've been working on them for quite a while, and they're still ongoing. They really? two boys. You, oh, your sons. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's never going to end. And All your boys. I have a 16, going to be 17, and I have a 22, going to be 23. Wow. Different. It's, it's crazy, isn't it? Well, my wife does most of the work. I just don't serve it. You know, Listen, you do, you, you know, it's interesting. So I have four boys. I have a 21, soon to be 22. That's how I got into real estate most like kids. I have a 12 year old and I have 90 year old twins. Really? Boys, and girls? All boys. Really? The twins are boys? All boys. Wow. Okay. And what's interesting about it is my wife says the same thing. Oh, you don't know what's going on in their soccer. You don't know what's going yes. on. But ultimately, as much as our wives are involved, you said they're our biggest project. They're looking to us as their role model. As their role model. Always. No, no doubt. Always. Last question I'll let you off the hook. I know your phone's going crazy. You got busy going on. A business going on. I like this guy, Alex. He's good. <laughs> I am who I am, man. You know, it is what you would Craig, me, I like him, Craig. You would be, you definitely get what you get, that's for sure. Book, podcast, or TED Talk recommendation for the audience. Either of the three, all three, none, I don't care. But if you have a book, a favorite book, or a podcast, or a TED Talk that you like, we, have, we always end the interviews I, with this question. I don't, I don't have anything that is my favorite because okay. I take bits and bites from, from them all. The TED Talks today on social media, you can pick up and you can get what it is. You know, it's amazing. Um, I still go to 60 Minutes or, or, or a Good Morning America on a Sunday morning at 9 a.m. I still watch those. I still open up the newspaper because I like the feeling of the paper. Um, but as time goes by, all of those elements are feeding 
information and data. And today, I watch Al Jazeera as I would watch the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal. And I don't have enough time to open up the newspaper, so I do sit down quietly, sure. and I can pick it up on the iPhones. But all of those vehicles today give you an opportunity to put your knowledge and information out there. And it's so critical because ultimately what I'm selling is the ability to create spaces that give people the comfort and the social and the, and the home and the, the mental relaxation. That has to be tied to a good design and has to be tied to a good value. Yeah, that's a great question. What gets, so I live out in Davie. Yes. And we bought, you know, the house is okay. It's 3,000 square feet, small for Davie standards, but we live on a 49,000 square foot lot. Yes. We bought it for the land. Yes. We bought it for the outside yes. space. How, how important is the outside space as the interior space? The exterior is primary, the architecture is secondary. The minute you you agree to that, I don't care if you design the palace over site or, or any building from China to, to Cambodia to, to Minneapolis, right? The, the, the environment is primary. Your one acre plus lot, mm -hmm. it's what you can do with it and within it on a daily basis that can make it even more special on the architecture on the inside. The architecture is a wall, it's a state set. But if you understand that, it's creating the outdoor spaces or in a city, it creates the urban spaces, parks, corner treatments, alleys, all of those spaces become the important spaces that we as a group share. It's where we talk, it's where we study, it's where we meet each other, it's where we create relationships, it's where it gives us the environment to talk to somebody. You can't carry a conversation sitting in a cafe and as a highway near you, right? Yeah. You need to have the thought process and how to design spaces that work for the individual. And you can see many people who say, oh, I go to Europe, right, to feel special or the old Madrid or like Roma or Naples. Or now, if you bring those environments into New York or into Miami, Miami has a great opportunity. Miami is the only subtropical weather ca capital city that we can have here in the United States of America. You can go to Peru, you can go to um, uh, Brazil, you can go to Argentina, but this is the only place that you can have a tropical weather urban metropolis. And it will expand from Miami all the way to Palm Beach. And it will be different. It will be different in its feeling and in its character. And, and the individuals who live there, you, live, you said in David, the Latin community in Davie is different than the Latin community in Little Havana, and it's different than the Latin community in Doral. And people are different, and how they behave in those environments due to their environment. The people who live in Miami Beach behave different than the individuals who live in Victoria Park and Fort Lauderdale. Yeah. They, they have different activities on a daily basis, but those activities need to be shared in a good quality with everybody. I just went up, to, up and down the river on the jet ski. The river is so underutilized. It is so underappreciated. It's starting to become now. Sure. You have food and beverage along the river, but the river in the next 10, 20 years is going to be the, um, one of the arteries that we have here that is so critical. There you go, start investing in the river. Kobe, I'm done, I'm gonna go around any party words with the camera. Best wishes. Where do they find you, Kobe? What's your website, uh, Instagram? It's me, it's kobekarp.com, K-O-B-I-K-A-R-P.com. Feel free to go on there on social media, Instagram, we're everywhere under that name. There you go. Thank you, Kobe. Thank you.